We're going to be sitting inside two windows of Excel for most of the day. I'm going to do a quick introduction to BAMSEC again. Um, someone's asking if I'm building a DCF from scratch. Yep, that, that's what this series is all about. Uh, so if you can see here on my screen, uh, we're putting together a DCF for Brooks Automation. You, for you guys who are new here, um, so Brooks Automation, they're in the semiconductor manufacturing automation process, and they also sell significantly in the life sciences industry. Uh, so I really like this business because they've taken a process that's particularly complex, uh, namely creating machinery for the production and, and processes for the production of semiconductors. And they realized, hey, that the, the building of semiconductors is really similar in process to uh, the maintenance of uh, bio, biological samples. And um, so, so they sold uh, machinery and, and workflow processes into the life sciences industry as well. And I always think that's really cool. That's a really power move uh, from, from management when you're able to transition something that you're really good at um, in, into an, a, a completely new customer group. And since then, uh, life sciences is, is pretty much half of the business. Uh, they also acquired a, um, a gene sequencing and, and synthesis business uh, that's Genuiz. Um, they have about $50 million in debt left on the balance sheet. They sold their cryogenics business in 2019 uh, to eliminate a bunch of that debt, uh, which ultimately originated from, uh, from, from the Genuiz acquisition. So these were all things that we did in the 10K reading. Um, so here's just assumptions tab as we flip through these tabs, historical balance sheets, income statements, cash flow statements. Uh, so what we did in a previous video, if you guys are new, is we ran through, and let me just lock my, um, perfect, all right. We just ran through the 10K and took down notes. Um, so some quick shortcuts in here, Alt H O I lets you auto fit column width. I, you may be asking why I'm dropping X's here on the left side of the tab, that's for navigation. So if you hit control arrow key, It'll jump to the next available cell in the row of the column that you're navigating in. So that's a, a way to quickly jump around Excel. But what we did in that live 10K reading um, was a, a summary of, of the operations from item one, uh, M&A history, what businesses were acquired and sold. They, again, sold the cryogenics business for $675 million in cash, which allowed them to pay off a lot of their debt balance. And they acquired Genoa's, uh, it looks like, end of 2018. And uh, that's kind of really built out uh, another big operating unit in their life sciences segment. Uh, we took down competitors that they noted in the 10K. Uh, we talked about risks from item 1A, that's the risks section. Uh, we looked at their capital structure, how much debt do they have. Uh, so they originally had a $200 million senior secured term loan. Uh, they added uh, a significant amount of debt to that term loan to make the Genoa's acquisition and when they sold the cryogenics business, um, they uh, eliminated a lot of that debt. So, and yeah, so that, that was what we got from the 10K reading. And we'll jump in here to the statements. So we organized the financial statements. That's what we did in the previous video. Uh, so these are all the cash flow statements organized by line items. Um, cash flow statements are often going to have very different line items year to year or quarter to quarter. And that's another note, we're modeling this business quarterly. Uh, often when you're getting introduced to financial modeling, just do things annually. It's, it's something to simplify the process with. And, um, but here we'll do it quarterly just because it gets us a better view and uh, we can make assumptions on a quarterly basis. The business is a bit cyclical in Q4, uh, so it's good to be able to capture that when you're modeling out quarterly. Uh, so here, you know, we can do a quick walk through the cash flow statement. We start with net income, uh, that, that's intrinsic to all cash flow statements. This is called the indirect method, starting with net income and uh, adjusting for non-cash expenses and changes in operating assets and liabilities. Uh, this is effectively how every public company in the U.S. is going to file their, their cash flow statement. Uh, so we start with net income. They add back a couple non-cash expenses, DNA, gain on settlements, uh, stock-based compensation. These are usually the big ticket items. Uh, you'll see there are line items here that only happened like in, in one quarter in the last couple of years. Um, someone's saying no volume. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Just got a message in the Discord. Someone could just confirm. So, um, but I, I see my mic moving here. All right, awesome. You guys can hear, perfect. So, yeah, so we've got some of these line items here that happen once uh, every couple quarters or so, um, specifically here, impairment of property plant equipment. Uh, so impairment is when, so, so when you acquire things, you put the historical cost of those items on your balance sheet. 
And uh, sometimes it, it turns out that the historical cost of that asset uh, is no longer the market value of that asset. And so when that's the case, you assess the asset for impairment. And uh, so they needed to impair uh, some items here, but that's a non-cash expense. Uh, it's an expense on the income statement, but no cash went out the door to simply say that something is worth less. Uh, so this is added back uh, in, in this case here on the non-cash expenses portion of the operating part of the cash flow statement. And then we make adjustments for operating assets and operating liabilities. Definitely go read through some of the lessons here. We have national accounting to understand how operating assets and liabilities link to cash flow. When operating assets go up, cash goes down. And when operating liabilities go up, cash goes up. Uh, uh, go up, yeah, cash goes up. So uh, in cash flows from investing activities, uh, purchases of PPE. Um, so this is effectively CapEx. We've, we've talked about that as well. And um, cash flow from financing. So this is when they're raising debt, raising equity. So here's proceeds from issuance of common stock. Uh, so this is any follow-on equity offerings. Uh, so it looks like they did like, um, uh, let's see, these should be, I should put units up here. I'm guessing these are in billions. What's the market cap of the business? Got it right here on Twitch. Market cap is about six billion. Okay, so these are probably millions here in equity follow-ons. All right, that's a quick chat through the cash flow statement. We then talked about the income statements. It's a bit simpler. Start with revenues, cost of revenues, which are then bring us to gross profit, taking out any operating expenses because it's operating income. Then these are interest income, interest expense. So when we model out the income statements today, uh, we are not going to be doing interest income and interest expense because we need to model out the balance sheets first. So this is where circularity comes from in financial models. You'll see here on the front of my model, on the cover, I have a circ switch. And this circ switch is effectively used to get around the interest rate circularity that happens in the business. So we can do a quick chat about that. I'll type it out on a sheet. Let's make a um, sheet here at the ends. So shift F11 makes a new tab, a new worksheet. Uh, just a quick shortcut for you guys. Alt W V G gets rid of grid lines, Alt W Q allows you to custom zoom. So I'm going to custom zoom over to uh, 150% so you guys can see better. Um, but I'm going to quickly do a note on circularity in financial models. What do we mean by that? This is really common and this is what you teach investment banking analysts and private equity analysts when they first start the job uh, because circularity is kind of the, the most common thing that's going to fuck up your model. And uh, if you mess up circularity, you can pretty much break your model for good unless you had saved a, uh, a version of your model prior um, uh, to you fucking it up. So this is very, very important. Um, so how does circularity work? Well, you've got revenues, right? So the business takes in revenues. Then you've got some interest expense. And that interest expense affects your net income, right? So net income, this is the final bottom line profit that a business has. You've got some revenues, you're removing an interest expense. And you've got some net income at the bottom. Well, as we know, right, net income, where does net income flow? It flows into two places. It flows into retained earnings on the income statement, as well as, oh, I need to put a quote around this, um, as well as uh, it's the top of the cash flow statement, which means that it affects cash. So net income affects cash. More specifically, here, interest expense affects cash. But we use cash to pay down debt. And we're going to assume that if the business has any additional cash on its balance sheet, it's going to use that to pay down debt, right? So this business is then paying down debt, which means that the debt balance, debt outstanding, goes down, which means that interest payments go down. But then we just had interest payments up here on the income statement, which affects net income, which then affects cash, which then affects debt payment, which then affects interest. So this is the circularity that you have in financial modeling with three statement models. And so the way we get around circularity is to have Excel do something called iterative calculations. So if you do Alt FT, you get into the options menu of Excel. You can jump over here to formulas and right over here, you see iterative calculations. So for now, we're gonna turn this off because we have a circ switch built in. But then when we want Excel to work with iterative calculations, we'll turn it back on. Um, but this is, this is kind of like lesson 101 once you get some new investment banking analysts fresh off the, the training program into their first models is like 
don't mess around with circularity because circularity will like like so for example here's an example uh say we have a hundred dollars in revenues minus ten dollars in interest expense um equals 90 so we have 90 dollars in cash um and then we pay off some amount we don't We have like an 8% interest rate or something. So this year you see circular reference. So I just got, I, I threw some, made up some numbers here, but this is just to show that um, uh, effectively, like we have a, an income statement that relies on the cash flow statement that then relies on the income statement. So this creates a circular reference in Excel and that will break your model. So I just did this very short form here on a sheet to show you how that works. Um, don't worry if this makes no sense. Excel is also gonna make these, uh, the, these arrows for you to show where circularity exists. If we then turn on iterative calculations, you'll be able to work through it. So if we go here, enable iterative calcs, boom. So now iteratively solves for the, effectively the answer to the set of linear equations uh, to, to the nearest decimal. It does like a hundred iterations per second. Um, and that's how that works. But we're going to ignore that for now and um, uh, we'll delete this sheet. This was just to give you guys a little nugget of something in the live stream. We'll go back Alt FT into the Excel options menu. Go to formulas and then Alt I to unenable iterative calcs. Nice stuff. Okay. Is there a way to make the view of the Excel sheet larger? Yes, I, I'll be, um, I'll, I'll do a zoom in here on the Excel sheet. Um, so we have projected income statements. So I did some work here already and I'm just effectively gonna walk you through um, what I've done here in Excel. So we're gonna call this custom alt C 150. Uh, let me know if this zoom level is good enough for you guys. I, I hope so. Um, you should just be able to read the, the words on the screen, the numbers on the screen as well, so that you guys know what I'm referencing. I'm also gonna create a new window in Excel. So you do that with Alt W N, so that I can effectively work in two places of my workbook at the same time and have those views open because we're gonna be jumping through um, a number of different sheets here. And it'd be great to have a view of our assumptions tab um, right here while we're working on the income statement. So I'm actually going to jump over into assumptions right here. Alt W V G again. All right, great. Now we're in the income statements. I'll take my AirPods out. So what we're doing today is we've pulled in the historical income statements for Brooks Automation here on this tab. So this pulls from the historical income statements tab. As you can see here, when I F2 into the cell. So F2 allows you to enter a cell and edit the formula or number inside. We uh, brought everything over here from the historical income statements and we started doing a couple calculations. And so I'll be doing those calculations here to start. So what we're gonna track is, let's start with growth rates in revenue. And maybe it makes sense to do a quick run through of the income statement again, uh, so, so you guys are clean there. But we start with revenue, um, they separate into products and services revenue. Uh, then those sum to a total revenue. There's a cost of revenue for both of those so that we can get an understanding of what gross margin is for both business lines of the business, which I've done here. Again, I'll walk through those calculations. Uh, gross profit, then operating expenses. Uh, so they bucket things into research and development, selling general administrative and restructuring charges. Uh, in accounting, we have something called, uh, I, I mean, a number of different words for it, but here I'll call it, say, specificity of, of the line items that you're presenting on your statements, right? So there, there are, like, technically, there are going to be expenses that fall out of, you know, perfectly the, these buckets here, research and development, sell, selling general administrative and restructuring charges. Um, but as, as long as these kind of one-off line items don't materially impact uh, the individual making a financial decision from the statements, we, we bucket them into these accounts. So research and development is broadly uh, any investment happening to the business to develop new products or to improve upon existing products. 
General, selling general administrative captures all of the selling and marketing functions of the business, as well as any overhead expenses, significant of that being paying the management team, uh, that falls under administrative. And then restructuring charges, uh, this is small stuff you know, relative to the expense base of the business. Um, but uh, if, if they were doing any restructuring of employees or the capital structure, uh, that happens here. I, I still have to go through the notes of the financial statements to find out exactly what is in these expenses because it feels rather recurring, um, but less and less important as we move forward. But uh, and, and when I projected these income statements, I just assumed we weren't going to have any restructuring charges. So those are total operating expenses. We then remove total OPEX uh, from gross profit to get to operating income. Then we have interest expense and interest income below. We just talked about circularity. So uh, I'm not going to spend, uh, we're not going to be projecting interest, in, in, interest income and interest income expense today. Um, but we will do so once we touch on the balance sheets because that will allow us to uh, work with the debt balance, uh, pull our interest expense from there, as well as pull our interest income uh, from the cash balance and uh, get rid of um, the circularities through iterative calculations. So that, that's uh, effectively what I was noting uh, earlier uh, in a discussion on the blank tab that I made. Um, I'm also going to zoom this sheet in uh, to, what do I want to zoom this to? Alt W, Q. So Alt W, Q lets you get to a custom zoom level. So Alt W, Q. Why is it not letting me? Can I not zoom in here? Yeah, okay. Let's do it anyway. Alt tab to get back into my original spreadsheet. Then we have income before income taxes. That is just operating income less interest. And we have an income tax provision that has an effective tax rate. That gets us to net income. So there's a core net margin here. Um, they discontinued some operations. And so when you discontinue operations, you uh, you, you place the, the effect on net income and net of tax at the bottom of the income statement. Uh, they also included not net of tax, but we really only care about this line item here in row 61. Then uh, we've got net income here. So this is net income after we account for discontinued operations um, generally. So this was the sale of the cryogenics business here. That's why we have this crazy net of tax number down here. Uh, but generally moving forward, um, less and less important part of the business. Uh, we're just gonna assume that um, income from discontinued operations is, uh, is, is a flat zilch. Um, and ta -ta, we've got some NCI. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about non-controlling interest, um, but this effectively means that uh, they, they own a majority portion of a business, uh, but not a full portion of the business. And so uh, the statements are consolidated, but we need to make an adjustment um, for the portion of the business that they don't own. And uh, that's your non-controlling interest. We have then net income attributable to Brooks Automation. That's kind of the bottom line item here, which has this an effective net margin. We take that net income and we divide it by both basic and diluted shares outstanding to get to a uh, um, uh, earnings per share, which is then these earnings per share are used in the price to earnings ratio. So if you divide share price by earnings per share, you get your nice price to earnings ratio, which we all know and love. If you don't, definitely go check it out. I've done videos on PE and why it's important. I'm also going to do a quick formatting thing right here. I'm going to take another one of these X's. I'm going to drop it down right here. And I'm going to do what's called end. Maybe I'll jump into a tab right here. I'm just copying what I've done here. So that if I in the tab, I don't want to fall off the corner of the spreadsheet, which is pretty annoying. So I'm just dropping this in here to make sure we don't fall off the spreadsheet. Okay, cool. So effectively now, if, if none of this made sense to you, that's perfectly fine. We're just going to run through this income statement and run through all of the calculations that I've done here. And uh, then we'll use those calculations to inform a set of assumptions uh, to, to move forward here with our projections of the Brooks Automation Income Statement. So I'm going to go ahead and just clear all of the assumptions that I made here a couple days ago when I was playing around. Alt H E C allows me to clear contents. So C for contents, but not formatting. Alt H E A gets rid of everything in the cell, including formatting. We didn't want to do that right there. We just wanted to get rid of the numbers. So let's get started. What calculations did I do here to help get an understanding of the business? Well, I started with revenue and I was looking at what, how is each uh, reporting segment or, or rather um, the reporting segments are technically uh, semiconductors and life sciences. 
but on the uh, income statement, they, they call it products and services revenue. So we're going to look how products and services revenue grow year over year. So what this means is we're looking, for example, at the quarter ended March 2018 against the quarter ended March 2017. And why do we do this? Why do we not do quarter over quarter growth? Why are we not looking at growth from, say, June 2017 to March 2017? Because there is some cyclicality in the business. And if there's some cyclicality in the business, revenues are favored in certain parts of the year, such as Q4. And so um, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're, you're comparing Q4 of one year to Q4 of another year. So that's why we do year over year growth. Um, someone's asking, will you be learning all of this through the lessons that I'm putting out? Yes, totally. Um, uh, that like a lot of this stuff is already out. Um, but I, for example, I'm putting out more lessons on analyzing income statements and balance sheets so that you guys get more and more comfortable with this work. Uh, I'll also be sending out workbooks to you guys uh, so that you can try these exercises yourself in a bit more simplified fashion and then build you up to uh, building your own discounted cash flow models in Excel uh, natively. So uh, that's kind of the plan uh, to turn you guys into full-blown analysts. Um, and uh, I'm learning a lot in this experience as well, kind of what, what is the best way to communicate this information most efficiently. Um, but I do think that in, in many respects, kind of just pulling you in head first um, is sometimes the best way to do it. So um, uh, we're just getting here in nitty gritty uh, projecting statements. And then eventually we'll get to effectively the discounted cash flow exercise and build out a weighted average cost of capital and then discount cash flows that we get from our pre-statement model uh, to arrive at an intrinsic value of the business. So Back to that conversation that we've had, these are year over year growth rates. We're comparing Q2, or excuse me, Q1 uh, 2018 to Q1 2017. We're doing the same thing for growth rates for products revenue, for service revenue, and for total revenue. And so we see the business is growing something like 21%, 22% year over year. Those are pretty fantastic growth rates. Didn't do so hot in 2018. Doing much better now in 2019, 2020, uh, as we see undersupply of, of semiconductors and, uh, and uh, new revenue that they've seen from growing the, the Genoa's acquisition. And uh, so the, the next step here, so, the, so you'll notice December 2020, this is the last data point that we have. And now there's March 2021, which we haven't received data for yet in June 2021, which doesn't even exist yet. And so what does this mean is we're projecting income statements. We're recreating the income statement for these future quarters. And so I'm going to freeze my panes right here. You do that with Alt W F F so that you can uh, oh, gotta freeze it right here. Alt W F F. You'll see what this means in a second with freezing panes. You'll notice that my column C is frozen and my row two is also frozen. So I can move down to the right, left, up on the spreadsheet and uh, always quickly get a view of what quarter I'm in as well as what line item I'm in on the income statement. And so this is super, super valuable for financial modeling, uh, freezing panes, again, Alt W F F. So here we are on products and services revenue. And what happens here? You notice this is pulling from the assumptions tab and the assumptions tab is over on the right upper right hand corner of my screen right now. So I'll jump in there right now with Alt tab. This is the assumptions tab. And so we are now looking, we're looking at growth rates for products revenue. So if I put in 20% right here, boom, you'll see that pop up on my left screen. Right? So I, this is the assumptions tab here where I can pop in assumptions for the future quarters on the income statements. And it's then reflected here on the left side on this income statement. And this is generally how we build financial models. We build an assumptions tab uh, that can carry from a number of different cases. So we can have a base case, upside case, downside case, uh, toggle those different cases in the financial model, which will then throw different assumptions here uh, into this item so that we can see what the value of the business is under a different set of assumptions. So here, I'll also freeze panes here on the assumptions tab. Alt W F F again. So if I jump back in here, you'll notice, you know, if we call this 15% growth, for growth products and services revenue, you'll see this is filling in here. And I'm, I'm not getting pedantic at all about how I'm making these assumptions. I'm just <laughs> dropping in random numbers. But the, uh, the point is that, you know, at like, as we get comfortable with this business, we will want to get very academic about the growth rates that we are projecting for the business year over year. And uh, so that's being dropped in here. You'll notice that's filled in uh, on, on the left side of my screen on my income statements. And uh, so now we've just taken you through the first calculation of projecting the income statement, namely revenue 
we're going to get a much more what's called granular revenue build. So we're going to get we're, we're going to project revenue, uh, perhaps even on a client basis. How many new contracts are they bringing in? What is the average value of that contract? And use that to inform revenue growth instead of just slapping a, a random number like fifteen percent. Uh, you want to get very academic, very granular, break things down to their units, and then uh, pro project the uh, project the income statements as such. So, so revenue projection uh, is, is really one of the most important pieces uh, of, of the financial modeling process because so many things rely on revenue. There are so many balance sheet accounts that rely on revenue, and uh, revenue is, of course, the, the top line of the income statement, and at revenue is what everything flows down from. Revenue is where, from which we get net income, flows into the top line of our cash flow statement and flows into less any dividends paid into the retained earnings on our balance sheet. Uh, so this is all super, super important. Uh, somebody asked here, uh, Nikhil asked, uh, where did I download the income statement balance sheet and cash flow from? Great, great question. I get these from bamsec.com. Uh, BAMSEC is where I find all of my regulatory filings. It's where I find the 10Ks, the 10Qs, the 8Ks. And um, they've got a, so BAMSEC is free to explore statements. They have some really great premium features uh, which include linking to specific words in regulatory filings, which is great when you're working on an investment banking and private equity team. Uh, I can link uh, an analysis that I've done or, or an input, uh, an assumption that I've made specifically to a certain word or number in a financial filing. And uh, so I can shoot that link over to a fellow analyst or associate and they can jump into the model and, uh, and, and see exactly where I'm pulling that information from. The second really great thing that happens with Bansec Premium is that you can merge financial statements, historical financial statements. So I've done that here, for example, on historical balance sheets. I'm gonna zoom in for you a little bit. Um, this pulled in all of the balance sheets uh, from all of the historical quarters and merged over the line items that we have here in column C. Uh, so I didn't have to go through and do that work. I actually just learned about this from BAMSEC not too long ago, um, but previously what I would do is I'd take in each individual balance sheet from each quarter and uh, make sure that I'm bucketing all of the line items here in column C in a uniform fashion for each quarter because line items can change. Um, so for example, like before they ever did an acquisition, they didn't have any goodwill. But after they made their first acquisition, they will likely have goodwill uh, because they're going to need to pay in excess of the fair value of the business uh, to acquire it. And that's where goodwill comes from. Uh, so goodwill is uh, acquisition payments in excess of the fair value of the uh, acquired business's balance sheet. Here we are in cost of revenue. So now we'll jump into the next part of this income statement. We've got revenue. What are the cost of goods sold related to that revenue? Well, historically, right, we see that both operating units are you know, running at something like 40% gross margin. Um, and so we'll take a look at, at uh, Brooks Automation's competitors, uh, both in the semiconductors and life sciences industry, to, to get a feel for you know, how, are, how are these gross margins competitive to their, uh, to their competitors. Um, what's really interesting here is that the services segment has seen such strong gross margin growth. This is probably due to the, to the Genoa's acquisition and the sell-off of their cryogenics business. Uh, but we'll need to take a closer look here. But these are some pretty significant changes, right? Like you, you don't usually see uh, business grow almost uh, 10 percentage points in their gross margin over a year. Um, but th this is pretty phenomenal performance here in the, in the services segment. Uh, so what we'll need to do here is the, the assumption we're making is what percentage of revenue is turning into gross profit. And so if we jump back here to the assumptions tab, this is where that assumption comes in. So we put in say 40%, maybe 50% uh, for services. And again, these are just really finger in the air assumptions, um, nothing academic or pedantic behind these assumptions. We will get there, but for now, we're just building out the structure of this income statement. Um, so we're, we're just filling in some placeholders for now. You'll see that these have all filled in here on the left side of my income statement. What, uh, how does that work? I am linking this cell here in T20 of the projected income statements tab to cell T11 of the assumptions tab. So that this tab here pulls in the value that I put into T11 on the assumptions tab. Um, since that's happening, actually this is, should be color coded green. So, um, That is not the right color, but if I, oh, I need to cycle through my colors. Perfect, okay. So green colors are used to show that this number is linked to another sheet in the same workbook. 
black colors are to show calculations. So here, this is a calculation within the sheet. Purple is a link to another workbook. So if I link this to a sheet outside of my workbook, and blue is a hard code. So why are these numbers here in the assumptions tab blue? Because they are hard coded numbers. I typed in 15%. That is a hard coded number. It not, it's not pulling from anywhere else in the sheet. It's not a calculation. So this is, uh, we, we color these numbers blue. Uh, this is a way to quickly identify when someone is auditing a model, uh, what are assumptions, what are hard codes, those are blue, uh, what are cells that are pulling from other sheets, and what are cells that are pulling from other workbooks. Um, so that's, that's how that works. Um, there's a, so I have a color cycler here, control apostrophe. Allows me to turn all of these green quickly. Um, that's a quick note. We'll do all the formatting work here. Uh, I actually have a shortcut that can like auto format the entire uh, sheet, uh, respective for what kind of input uh, the cell has. Uh, I won't do that just yet. Um, it also might crash my stream on Twitch, so I'm a little worried about that. But uh, for now, we'll just use the kind of the um, manual way of, of color coding these cells with um, control apostrophe. Great. Now we're down to gross profit. And the next step <coughs> is to look at our operating expense base. And so what I've decided to do here is to look at research and development expense year over year growth. So here again, you'll see I'm comparing Q4 2020 to Q4 2019 doing the same thing for check, selling general and administrative. I'm also looking at SGNA as a percentage of revenue. Um, and I modeled out both with year over year growth. Uh, so I decided for both research and development and selling and general administrative expense that we would grow those expenses on a year over year basis. And that'll get us down to operating income once we've modeled out these expenses. So similar to revenue, you're, you're looking at the growth of this expense base uh, from Q4 2019 to Q4 2020, and uh, that's the same for SGNA. I also did it as a percentage of revenue SGNA. Um, we, we could also model it that way. We, we could make assumptions in future years what percentage of total revenue comes from selling general administrative expense. Um, but for now, we'll, we'll keep it simple, and um, I'll, I'll stick with year over year. Although, you know, percentage of revenue is also not that complicated. Um, but we'll drop those assumptions here. So let's say we'll grow each at 8% year over year for the next years. Again, simple assumption, not reflective of what we actually think about this business, but placeholders. Uh, and we'll call here, we also made an assumption here on restructuring charges gross. So these are dollar amounts. So I'm making assumptions explicitly on what we think restructuring charges are going to be moving forward. Um, we're not going to make any assumptions around restructuring just yet, so we'll make that very simple. We'll just call that zero. So here we are. We're not moving forward there, but notice that these numbers have all filled in. So this pulls from assumptions T17. This is directly the restructuring charge number. This pulls, are here. these now pull from the assumptions tab. And these future expense numbers rely on those assumptions tabs or uh, assumptions inputs. And that's how we get to operating income. And remember here, this is interest income, interest expense. We're skipping over that for now because we need to do the balance sheets before we can uh, jump into iterative calculations for interest income and interest expense. You'll notice what I've done here, this is the circ switch on the cover. I'm saying if this is equal to zero, set interest income and interest expense equal to zero, otherwise zero, but eventually this is going to be uh, this middle zero is going to be the formula for interest expense based off the ending balance of debt and cash on the balance sheets. But we'll get there. Loss on extinguishment of debt. Uh, this was a one-time light item. So when they sold the cryogenics business to pay off a bunch of their debt, uh, they, they had an additional expense to do so. So there was a, a covenant in their debt agreement uh, that uh, when they extinguished their debt early, uh, there would be an additional loss that, that they like didn't anticipate when they first wrote up the debt agreement that they would have had. Uh, so this is a, a loss that, that is seen on the income statement. It's extraordinary. It's not something uh, related to the day-to-day -day operations of the business. So it's considered a loss and not an expense, um, but it does of course affect net income. And, um, but generally moving forward for all of these losses and gains and other expenses, we're assuming that these are extraordinary one-time items and uh, we'll call these zeros. So we'll also fill these in with zeros. Other expenses, 
Perfect. That's all just pulling straight here from assumptions. Oh, actually. This should pull. This is a percentage here. Other expenses percent of their revenue. But we're also going to call it zero. So, end of the day, same thing. Okay, we got income before income taxes. So this is like we've removed, we, we took EBIT, which is operating income, earnings before interest and taxes. We removed interest. So now we have EBT. This is earnings before tax. So effectively, the last expense we have here is income tax provision. And we have one more assumption here before we get to net income, which is the income tax provision. What percentage of earnings before tax is going to be thrown away to taxes? And uh, th this is a business that operates in many different countries. So we're going to need to do quite a bit of tax diligence, uh, particularly in China, to come to uh, what should the effective tax rate for this business be. <laughs> but for now, let's just call it 15%. We'll say that the prior year is, uh, is reflective of what the business will look like into the future. But you know, as, as we love to say in financial modeling, uh, historical performance does not imply future performance. So um, you know, it, it's not good to say, a business will do Y because last year it did X. Uh, we, we want to get really intelligent about the thesis that we're building for the business and uh, make some assumptions that uh, that that really make sense with, with the thesis that we've created. Um, ba -bum. Okay, now we're going to go to the items below core net income. So we have our tax expense that gets us to interest in, uh, or um, uh, net income before equity and earnings of equity method investments. This was a prior line item. Um, so equity and earnings of equity method investments means that they had a minority stake in another business. And because they have a minority stake, they're not consolidating the financial statements of those two businesses. Instead, what they do is they say, okay, our primary business generates a certain amount of net income. We have maybe a 10% share in another business, and we're then going to recognize our portion of that business's net income, namely 10% uh, on our income statement, which is what they've done here. Um, it looks like they don't have that minority stake in the business anymore as of end of Q2 2018. Uh, so this really won't affect our uh, statements moving forward, um, but just to, to touch on what, what that line item is. And then you also have income from discontinued operations. Uh, so this is likely a lot of stuff from the cryogenics business. And uh, they tell us what that income is net of tax here. We can actually get rid of this income from discontinued operations line item. That's alt H D R. All we really care about is this uh, net of tax number. We have a ref here. Um, historical income statements. This should be net loss attributable to non-controlling interest. Net income attributable to gross automation. Drag that over. Okay, all clean. Okay, so we've got this income from discontinued operations and of tax. Uh, this effectively isn't isn't it, it doesn't really matter much anymore. Um, this is the sale of the cryogenics business. Again, net of any tax business on that sale. Total net income. Net loss attributable to non-controlling interest. We touched on that earlier, um, but this also doesn't look like it's going to present anything materially for the business moving forward. Net income attributable to Brooks Automation, effective net margin, and then we're going to do some per share stuff here. I see on the assumptions tab we, we did some, um, uh, these are the line items for your equity and earnings of equity investments, discontinued operations and of tax, and net loss attributable to non controlling interest. We're going to call all of these zero, given that we're, we're not going to project that, uh, that there's something meaningful here in the, in the, next, in the next years. And then basic share count. So eventually this is gonna become more dynamic, uh, these, these share count numbers. And you'll notice here we have a div zero error because we don't have any assumptions yet in Q1 of 2021. But uh, here we've got basic share count. That's gonna uh, fill in, where are the share count numbers? Are they down here? Yeah, they're right here. So the these, these pull from the assumptions tab, T34, T35. Uh, so we're, we're gonna chuck assumptions in here about basic share count, fully diluted share count. Uh, eventually, these are going to be dynamic. So if we want to model in, say, like an equity follow-on offering, 
and that they're going to sell more shares to the public markets. That should be dynamic, right? They, they might get cash from that follow-on, but that cash should be grounded in uh, the, the value and number of the shares uh, that they're going to be distributing uh, to receive that cash. But for now, we'll just assume that um, uh, the basic and diluted share count is equal to what it was in the most recent quarter of the filings that we have, which is for December 2020. And uh, so what I did here, I locked um, this cell into column S so that it always will pull here. Um, we're not making any changes to the row number we're in. So if I just go over here, hit control R, it'll paste that formula to the right. So here we've got now all of our basic outstanding, basic shares outstanding, diluted shares outstanding. And we use that to calculate our basic net income per share and our diluted net income per share. Notice they're not that different, right? Uh, the number of dilutive securities doesn't seem to be super high in the business. Uh, we will do an exercise where we calculate the fully diluted shares outstanding. Uh, there might be a difference in how I choose to calculate fully diluted shares outstanding and the way that the business chose to calculate fully diluted shares outstanding. Uh, given that the business wants to present as high uh, as possible of a fully diluted share count, um, they uh, sorry, as low as possible of a fully diluted share count to show as high as possible of an earnings per share, um, we, we might end up at a fully diluted number that's a bit higher than what the business is estimating. Um, but we'll take a look at that you know, in, 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 the, in another live stream where we're assessing the number of diluted shares in the business. I've done a TikTok, 30 seconds on uh, what, what are diluted securities um, and uh, how does that affect ownership and dilution in the business. And so definitely go check that out as well. Um, but now here we are really at the bottom of the income statement. We've projected everything on this income statement from revenue to net income to earnings per share. And uh, this is now a projected set of income statements all the way through, what do we model this to? December, 2025. So Q4, 2025, uh, maybe we'll model this for another year into 2026. Again, we're gonna get more academic about the assumptions that we've made uh, here on the assumptions tab. Uh, but for now, we've kept it relatively simple and uh, made some high level assumptions for revenue growth, for gross margin for both of the business's segments, for operating expenses growth, research and development, SG&A, restructuring charges, as well as other income and expenses. And uh, then um, we also did some, some below core net income assumptions, but we called those all zero. Uh, we, we aren't specifically modeling in any minority investments or income from other discontinued operations, uh, as well as any net loss attributable with NCI, uh, given that the business hasn't had um, any earnings in equity method investments, nor net loss to NCI or net income from NCI in, in over a year. And uh, we also projected forward share count, but again, share count is going to become dynamic if we choose to model in uh, any, any cash flow from equity financing. Um, as well as any share buybacks potentially from a, uh, if, if there's a bloated cash balance. Um, but they still have to pay off some debt before we use that cash balance for any share repurchases. So yeah, guys, um, this was great. Uh, always excited to do some financial modeling on a Sunday afternoon. Um, so the next thing we'll do is we'll project for the balance sheets. I'll walk you through the balance sheet projection. Uh, for those of you guys who follow us on Patreon, um, and uh, so I'll be uploading this video on YouTube, but for those of us on Patreon that have subscribed to our investing education tier, uh, I drop the backups for these Excel files uh, into our chat, as well as uh, in the Patreon directly. Um, so uh, definitely um, uh, go check that out if, if you're in those tiers. So uh, I'm also gonna leave this open for a bit of Q&A uh, for five or 10 minutes. And I see someone's ahead of me, someone's asking, if I know anything about the Aquiline London office, is it possible to intern as a student from Europe uh, at a European target school? Yeah, definitely. So the, the Aquiline London office um, works pretty closely with the New York office. Uh, in the New York office, I was looking at a number of, uh, of software deals in, in the Nordic states. So um, Benelux, uh, uh, Finland, Norway, Sweden, uh, uh, the Netherlands. And uh, I was doing that from New York um, but whenever we were jumping into a deal process with someone there, we'd pull in the London office and get the London team involved as well. Um, so you know, you know, you can likely find yourself touching a lot of things in, in Europe too, but um, all of like the banking relationships to raise debt when we do a private equity investment, uh, that a lot of that gets handled when it's, it's happening in Europe much more through the Europe office. 
really awesome, awesome partner in Europe, uh, Inyo. He's super cool, really, really intelligent, and uh, he, he kills it over in the uh, in the London office. Um, so I've seen uh, currently, I think the the analyst associate base in the London office um, is primarily of individuals who went to European schools and, uh, and, and did their investment banking program either in London or Frankfurt. Um, and, uh, so definitely, yeah, I, I think, um, I, I don't know if they're looking for interns right now. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm obviously not part of their, their recruiting process anymore. And, uh, when I was an analyst at Aquiline, I, I did, um, I was part of the super days for the analyst hires and, and summer analyst hires in New York. Um, but wasn't part of the, the London office. So I don't know exactly what that process looks like. Um, but definitely, you know, reach out to, to HR, drop them a line um, if you're potentially interested. Um, looks like there's, you know, if there, if there are any other questions from you guys who are, who are still here in the um, in the Twitch chat, definitely drop them below. Um, I hope that the quality of this stream has been good. Um, here, I'll just type that in as well. Um, can you guys like rate the quality of this stream on a, uh, you know, out of 10? Um, like video quality, audio quality, not necessarily my quality. And yeah, so if there aren't any other questions, um, I'd probably err on the side of shutting down the Twitch stream and we'll do the balance sheet next. Um, again, I'll upload this Excel doc uh, for those of you in the Discord Awesome. There's an Austrian here. Uh, das ist super. Also, meine Familie kommt von München. Um, ich bin schon seit acht Jahren in den USA. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great, great, uh, great. That I, I, I had the same decision making process uh, for, for private equity versus investment banking out of undergrad. Um, so, I was a summer analyst at, at JP Morgan in their healthcare group in, over in San Francisco. Um, had a full-time offer to, to come back there, but ultimately decided um, to, uh, to jump into investment banking. Um, sorry, to, into private equity. Um, uh, the, the primary thinking there was the, the intellectual creativity that you experience as an analyst is, uh, is, is far more available in, in PE than IB. Right? In IB, you're executing the thesis points of your superiors quite rigidly. You know, if, if you're selling a business, there is a pretty clear price that that business, that the managing director wants to sell that business at. And it's your job as the analyst kind of at all costs to get to that number. Um, whereas in private equity, it's, it's a lot more about, you know, if a business comes across the desk, you're taking the first look and um, you're building the initial investment model. And if you think that's not an attractive business, then you let the team know and maybe the business gets dropped and vice versa, right? And so that, that, leaves you feeling um, uh, a lot more impactful in your day-to-day -day workflow uh, than I think you get in the investment banking process. Um, but those are just my personal experiences. They're very different investment banking experiences if you're at a bulge bracket bank or at a boutique bank um, or what group you're in at a particular bank. And there are also many, many very different private equity funds out there. Um, but yeah, all fantastic questions. I will see you guys again soon. I'll probably jump on to another live stream tomorrow as we continue here with the discounted cash flow model for books automation. Uh, but I hope this was super helpful and uh, also stay tuned for some more YouTube content. So see you guys.